Okay, my name is Jason. I'm uh, sometimes called Oslo. I'm with my friend John Johnson. And John, I'm going to start by telling you, you asked me why I'm doing this. And uh, I want to tell you what it's not. It's not journalism, where people are trying to get a story and the truth. You don't need to tell me the truth at all. <laughs> Certainly don't need to tell me a story. Okay. But it, it's the vision I have is kind of like a photo album. But there are times when people have photo albums where there's a little bit of an artistic bent. Maybe uh, kids first got a camera and they were experimenting with it and seeing what they could do. Or people had the idea that you can take pictures and make them look good or make them look a certain way. And my bit is this. Even though this is kind of a, a photo album for me, I'd like it to be good. I'd like it to be interesting. And that's why I tell people it's, I don't like to call it an interview, even though I will ask you questions. But I don't require truth, and I don't require talking about something important. That said, I'm with John Johnson, and we're in a teepee. And you'd be hard-pressed to talk to anyone else in a teepee for about <laughs> 100, 500 miles around. So why are we here? Well, we built this teepee because I'd had teepees for about 50 years, and uh, I guess six or seven of them, worn them, worn them out. And I always wanted to use the space under the cover better, more efficiently, because a TP is close to a cone shape. It's not actually the footprint is actually an egg, but it's close to a cone shape, so the space close to the edges of the walls is pretty much unusable, except you can stow gear there. You can't stand up. So I wanted to create a space where I could use the TP more as a roof and be able to use all the space out to the edges of the cover. But you make it seem like it's kind of an architectural desire, and I saw it when I first saw you building it way back. I saw it as almost more of a, a spiritual connection in the same way that some people are very into pyramids. Other people, they want to live in a dome. I thought maybe you had some type of, I don't like the word spiritual because it makes me think of spirits, but some kind of deeper inclination towards the, the, the architecture of a teepee. Yeah, I, I don't consider myself a person that's sensitive to the, I don't know, the spiritual ethers, but I still get a feeling when I'm in a teepee. I get a special feeling of being close to the earth and connected with the history of the earth here in North America because these, these, these structures were developed by the Plains Indians, you know, over God knows how many years they perfected this design. So I just, I like the feeling of it. I like the look of it. And uh, I've always been a person about camping and the outdoors. So it just made sense. And uh, to, to, you know, to, uh, I don't know, take it somewhere else to, to give, open it up to the public to sit down here and have conversations. To me, it's a stimulating environment for a conversation. So it worked. <laughs> yeah. We're down here. I think so. Well, let's bounce off that for a bit, uh, talking about the Plains Indians and talking about um, the outdoors. Where did you grow up? We're in, and for the listeners who don't know, we're in West Texas now. We're in Marfa, Texas. I'm certainly not from here. Are, are you? Well, my family had a cotton farm 45, 50 miles down the road here in a place called Lobo, mm -hmm. which today there's only probably two people that are farming there, two organizations. One of them is an agribusiness that is has the pecan orchards. You've probably sure. passed them on the way to or from El Paso headed toward Van Horn. Yeah, now, is that Lobo? Is that That's area? the Lobo Valley. Uh-huh. Yeah. But it, I don't see any towns or anything there. Well, there were 28 families at least out there farming when we lived there in the 50s and 60s and were farming. We farmed all the way to the 1978, but I, I wasn't interested in farming. My pop was a petroleum engineer that gave up that line of work to buy a farm and start farming, and he loved it. And my mother loved living in that valley. And uh, do you know where the mountain Chispa is on the right side of the highway headed toward Van Horn? Yes, I do. Well, our farm was directly across from Chispa, about four miles across the other side of the valley on the farm road. And uh, that's where I grew up, you know, grew up in the outdoors. And I, I really consider myself to be a highly privileged person. 
not because I grew up in a family of, of any class standing uh, or any particular wealth, you know. Uh, I just consider myself to be privileged because I've had the opportunity to educate myself in a number of different ways that most people are denied. You know, I grew up on a farm, so I got to do a lot of work outdoors. I got to be close to tractors and farm equipment, animals, airplanes. Well, first of all, that that shows some optimism. I could see someone regretting the very same upbringing, and you don't. And that tells me uh, possibly more about you than your upbringing would. But let me tell you what I believe about you, and you come in and correct me where I'm wrong. Now, I, I don't know any of the things I'm going to say for a fact. So uh, I, I think it might be impressive to you what someone comes up with when they have to make up their own story. Um, Obviously, or not obviously, but I thought you were from Canada somehow just because of the name, so I was wrong about that. But you seem like a guy who is has a lot of schooling behind him somehow because I know you, you teach or you have taught and you, uh, you enjoy teaching in the same way maybe that I enjoy doing these interviews, which is that even uh, when money and institutions aren't backing you up, you still like to teach. I know that you build a lot, and you build creatively. So that tells me, or that suggests to me, that you see building as not contracting for someone, but kind of a bit of its own art form, as I do as well. You're a civic guy. I know that um, you were working with the Rotary Club for a while, and then you uh, started doing your own thing with that garden. And I guess there are a lot of reasons to be with the Rotary Club. Uh, Free food, lunch break, maybe some girls, if depending on which Rotary Club you're in. But you uh, went ahead and started doing the garden thing, which tells me that there's actually a civic motivation in it for you. And, I mean, I could go on, but the, the biggest thing is this. You built this place, this Planet Marfa, in kind of a chitty-chitty bang-bang way, in that no one knew what it was until it kind of popped up. And, you know, people would say, well, that's a teepee, that looks like a school bus. That looks like a library. Maybe that's the ping pong area. And after, I don't know, three years, help me out, however long, it's kind of emerged into one of the coolest places in town, maybe for quite a distance away. Well, thank you for the compliments. Um, Yeah, you're right. Uh, Teaching is a rewarding profession, and uh, although... My father, being a practical engineer type uh, and a farmer, he always told me that teachers teach because they can't do. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I looked at the teachers I had, it pretty much rang true. That was so until I went away to military school. Uh, I got shipped out to military school when I was 15. What year was that? 1958. Mm -hmm. Am I... uh, you know, my name, William Wing Canada, was my biological father's name also. I was junior, but he never came back from a bombing mission over Japan during World War II, so I really never had a chance to know him. And when Jimmy married my mother at age, I was 10 years old when uh, he married my mother, he thought, I think he thought, this is my take on it, I think he thought that that name, Wing Canada was a little bit too Hollywood. His name was James A. Johnson, and he had these beautiful cufflinks that he used to wear, and uh, he said, you're going to inherit these cufflinks, but I'm going to change your name to so you'll have a J-A-J just like I have. So your birth name was Wing Canada? Yeah, William Wing Canada Jr., yeah. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) Your last name was Canada? Right. That's my family from Arkansas was named Canada. A man from Arkansas, Hot Springs, married my mother during World War II. And has it ever occurred to you, I'm sure it must have, that you've gone the opposite way? Most people start off with the more conventional uh, standard name and then feel like they have to express themselves (laughs) and branch out into something more exotic and come up with something like Wing Canada. And here you are. You were born with Wing Canada, which I think actually fits you pretty well <laughs> and then you uh you adopted john johnson my father adopted me he thought he'd bring our family closer together so he renamed me 
and, and changed my whole name. Yeah. And, and Mr. Canada died in a flying mission? Is that what you told yeah, me? Yeah, he was a bomber pilot in World War II. Uh, mm -hmm. I ended up being raised by my my mother as a single parent, although her sister Dixie, who now lives with us, by the way, she's 93. She lives here with us. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a recent development. But um, we went to live with my Aunt Dixie and my Uncle Dow. And uh, they were a pretty neat couple because it was Dallas and Dixie Hill. And that was in Abilene, Texas. And he was a farm implements dealer. But he was also a flyer from World War II. So he had his own beach bonanza that he would fly on business trips. And he would come to the elementary school and take me out of school and say, I'm taking a little wing with me. And... Uh, I would get to go with him as a just a elementary, you know, kid. What is a beach on bonanza these look business like? trips? It's a V-tail single-engine beach craft. Mm -hmm. It's a beautiful airplane, and he he flew it well until he killed himself in it. When I was age nine, I guess I was eight or nine, uh, he flew into a mountain out here in El Paso. Actually, uh, we think it was a, a night flight. We think he got carburetor icing and couldn't climb over the mountain. So growing up, you had two stories of people who died flying. Yeah, when I when I was accepted in the Navy flight program, my mother was, well, she was terrified because she thought she was going to lose another male member of our family. Yeah, I'm on her to side. To flying, you know. Yeah, well, the odds are were not in your favor, genetically speaking, or as far as family. Mm, it's probably true, but I had, I had this love of flying that, Mm -hmm. just came naturally. And, uh, fortunately, my eyes were good enough, so the Navy took me into the flight program. And obviously this was uh, right around the time of Vietnam, and so you were, yeah. uh, you were exported over there. And did you fly? What, what type of missions did you fly? Our squadron was on an aircraft carrier, and it was a carrier-based aviation. And uh, it was I flew a twin-engine torpedo plane made by Grumman called a Tracker. And um, in the Navy, they called them uh, Stoof, or uh, S-2, uh, S-2F. And uh, the squadron I was in had the mission to kill submarines, so we carried... Uh, atomic warhead torpedoes in the torpedo bay, but we never used them. And as a matter of fact, the Tonkin Gulf turned out to be too shallow for submarines, so our mission changed to gunfire spotting and, uh, and uh, surveillance over the shipping going in and out of Hanoi. So it was a pretty um, unhazardous mission, though we were on, in the war zone. I came back with a war medal, I mean with an air medal, but... You know, we didn't lose any aircraft, and we didn't lose any pilots. You know, you, you say that, and I'm sure it's true, but as you've just explained, you can, uh, in a plane, you can lose a life even if it's not military, even if it's purely recreational. So there's big risks in flying, period, and military flying for sure. And I'm sure that must have occurred to you while you were out there, right? Well, in the middle of the night when you're coming in for a landing on that aircraft carrier and the seas are rough, that tail end of that aircraft carrier is doing a figure eight, going like that. Mm -hmm. And you're supposed to fly that mirror, the Fresnel lens system. You're supposed to fly the glide path, this beam of light that helps guide you onto the aircraft carrier deck. That's pretty hairy because you're flying in a sock. You, you're basically no... No reference, no visual reference with the horizon at all. You're just flying with a couple of lights mm -hmm. in the middle of a total black sock. So that's that's a little hairy. And we had a couple of times when we had to had to land in Saigon um, because of landing gear or hook problems. You know, your hook has to be functioning properly, and if you get a bolter, which is a missed landing on aircraft carrier, you have to keep on flying and find somewhere else to land if your hook is dysfunctional. The hook is, so on, on aircraft carriers, because they're not as big as an entire airport, you have a hook and a wire that basically prevent you from going over the edge. Yeah, four wires that are laid across the deck, and they're hydraulically controlled. So huh. when, you, when, you, when you hook one, you know, you can have a hook bounce, 
and it'll it can bounce across all four wires Miss on occasion. Wow. Yeah, and the flight safety officers yelling at you, bolter, bolter, and you better get both engines on full power right away because you're going to be sinking below the level of the carrier deck. You only got 60 feet or so before you hit the water. So your air, your landing gear are down. You're dirty. Your flaps are down. You know you're a dirt. You're in a dirty configuration, not a clean configuration. So you have to mm -hmm. few things to do in the cockpit pretty quickly so you don't hit, go into the water. But like I say, we didn't lose any aircraft. We had a highly trained uh, group of pilots and uh, and an excellent C CO, commanding officer. When did you officer. leave the military? 1969, I got out, and my, you know, I immediately bought, I, w I had a case of wanderlust from the Navy because I'd been to the Far East, Philippines, Hong Kong, Singapore, Japan, and uh, so I wanted, I had this desire to travel. I was engaged to a beautiful young lady from Point Loma, just, just uh, south of, of La Jolla in California, but I broke that engagement off because I just told her I've, I've got to see the other side of the world before I settle down and bought a one-way ticket, sold a car, and bought a one-way ticket to Europe. And in spent, 1969? Yeah. <laughs> spent the next year walking around over there. Let me give you a barrage of things that pop into my <laughs> mind. Um, one is that it's possible... Uh, that you missed, uh, in, in a certain sense, the 60s in the United States. And it's possible that you got the 60s in the most intense way possible <laughs> in Vietnam and then Europe. And Not actually. You know, I was stationed in California for five years, so in, from four years. Uh, until 67. So, uh, yeah, as a matter of fact, the Summer of Love, uh, I was, my duty station moved from Dallas Naval Air Station to... San Diego, so I just bought a brand new Volkswagen bus and, and I already owned a, a 500cc motorcycle and I put it in the back of the bus, shipped all, my, all the Volkswagen seats out to my new duty station. And a friend of mine and I went to Aspen on the, the same weekend that Sgt. Pepper, Lonely Hearts Cub Band album was released by the Beatles. Mm -hmm. And uh, Aspen, Colorado was going nuts. The, everybody up there was playing that album on their balconies. You know, it was early summer. And were, we, were you going nuts? Were you, did you go crazy for that record, too? Well, the record was just a part of the scene. Mm -hmm. You know, at the same... This was called The Summer of Love. So in San Francisco, everybody was hitchhiking and getting rides out to San Francisco to be, take part in the the love in that was happening in the hate district of San Francisco. So you've heard the songs, you know all yeah. about it. Uh, 67 was uh, the year that that we picked up a, a guy, a friend of ours up there in, in Aspen named Machine Gun Kelly. And, and he said, I know two stewardesses that, that live five blocks from the hate and they're not always in their apartment. Let's go see if we can hang out there. So we just all drove to the to the hate, and that was my introduction to, well, not my introduction to California because I'd been to California before, but that was, uh, you know, my introduction to the to the hippie culture of that time. So if someone, and we're going to get back to this because I'm I'm interested in it a lot, but if someone were to meet you now. And you're certainly an accomplished guy, but you're also easygoing, I would say. And that, that kind of fits the fact that you have a, what you're doing for a living now is basically mixing with people, all kinds of people. What, did the military help you with that, hurt you with that, have oh, no yeah. effect? No, the, the Navy is a great social education by itself. So I think, you know, we ought to go back to the draft because I think every young person ought to have sometime in the military. My wife is from Norway, and in Norway they still have compulsory military service as part of the, um, part of their legal, legally you're required to serve. And I think it's a good thing, you know, the, the, I served as a squadron power plants officer for a couple of years, which meant that I was the officer in charge of about 20 men 
who maintained the, the engines for the aircraft. It was a mechanics shop, basically. But there was also a senior chief that was in charge of keeping things going, and he knew what he was doing. He, he was, you know, 35 years in the Navy, senior chief with a lot of stripes on his sleeve. And uh, the chief was the key to uh, managing because, you know, I was basically just a college graduate with officer training behind me and had no clue about the technical aspects of the job. So I had to walk in there, and at the same time that I was the one that requisitioned everything for the department and made sure people were functioning harmoniously, you know, I had to be accepted by the people who were technically a lot more proficient than I was. And in terms of the Navy, I had a lot more time in service. And uh, that's a delicate balancing act. You know, you're a 90-day wonder, what you call a, an officer with no real background in the Navy other than a couple of years, you know, of flight training. So uh, it's it's no, but you you well, know but, the but, navy is like high school. You have a cross section of America in there. Yeah, it's not like college where you have you've already had this screening process happen. Right. Are you aware that Robert Arbor was in the navy and got out in 1967 or 68? I believe. Yeah, we've got a couple of people in town here that I get together and we uh, we share war stories and and things like that and talk about those days. Those days gone by, there's a couple of people in town here. If you don't mind, I'd like to ask you just about a bunch of events and see how you remember them. Um, you can, we'll do, go through them quick, but I, I think I was saying that this is a scrapbook, but this part actually is a little bit of journalism for myself because these are the, what I'm going to ask you about are these seminal events that have basically shaped the world that we live in. Do you recall John F. Kennedy dying, being killed? Oh, yeah. Where were you? Uh, let's see, where was I? I think I was in the Navy, and I think I was overseas at that time. And did it have the big impact that we frequently hear it having on you? Oh, yeah, it was, well, it was a huge traumatic event for the country and for all of us, yeah, everybody that was of age. And growing up in West Texas, which is not the most progressive place, but uh, did you follow the civil rights movement and Martin Luther King? And do you remember his being shot in 1968? Yeah, I don't remember where I was. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, sure, I remember all those events. And uh, yeah, they're very sobering. You know, uh, you have a picture of what the country is like, and then something like that happens. And you try to explain it to yourself, but. I don't know if there's ever any, you know, satisfying explanation for yeah. things like that. You weren't drafted, um, and I have, funnily enough, no. I'm of an age where I have a lot of older friends who were in Vietnam in the military, and a surprising number of them, they were not drafted. And I, I think... Vietnam was really the dividing line of when people of all stripes kind of freely enlisted and when it became uh, a professional army and they had to give you incentives to be paid enough and, you you know, the college stuff. And But I, I have a friend in um, Las Vegas who was from oil fields in Texas. He enlisted out of uh, patriotism. He thought the military was a very good way to go. And another friend in Los Angeles who uh, was shooting pictures from a helicopter in Cambodia. And it seems to me now they, or by 1970, should we say, they had kind of changed their minds about some stuff. Um, do you fit in that at all? Yeah, you know, a lot of, a lot of the, even among the officer corps uh, in the Navy, there were a number of us who... We're reading the papers and we're reading alternative press and we're understanding that this war was not necessarily a just war or a, a war that that had any purpose that we could really get behind. So um, it already had trouble with that before. 
I was discharged. I never raised any hell with it, mm -hmm. but you know, uh, I fulfilled my commitment. But after I got out, I was uh, a member of the Vietnam Veterans Against the War, and um, that was in San Antonio, and uh, participated with that group to try to end the war. So uh, I don't know exactly where that goes, but it, it it's uh, another chapter, yeah. In, in your mind, when do you suppose you stopped being a farm boy? I'm talking about in your mind. I know when you left. Oh, that's easy. Yeah. When I got my wings in the Navy, huh? Because at that point, I sort of changed my whole the way I looked at myself. But once once I got my wings, you know, um, from that point forward, <clears throat> you have a certain level of responsibility that forces you to grow up, you know, and then. Going overseas with with uh, the aircraft carrier and so on. Uh, no, that's you know I told the recruiter in uh, in Los Alamitos Naval Air Station where I was about to join the Marines because I I believed that if I was gonna and I was gonna be drafted uh, if I was gonna be have to serve I'd rather serve in the Marine Corps because I got to know a bunch of those boys out in Laguna Beach where I was hanging out. And uh, San Clemente, and, and I said, you know, if I'm going overseas, I'm going as a Marine. But then I went to the Los Alamitos Naval Air Station, and they gave me the the test for your vision, and I passed that okay. And they said, you should take the flight exam, and so I took that. And there were questions on the flight exam that were, to me, they were hilarious. But for a farm kid, they were so easy to answer, you know, like if you if the hammer is here and you're pulling on the nail, which which side of the hammer do you push on to pull the I mean, simple leverage stuff that um, I guess someone who grew up in a city would that had no experience with tools would have trouble answering. Then there were questions like, uh, who was the author of The Scarlet Letter? Mm -hmm. If you answered that one correctly, it counted against you for <laughs> qualifying for the Naval Flight Program. <laughs> Which was pretty funny. They had found out, I guess, that, that Navy pilots generally, the ones that didn't wash out in flight school, right. didn't know the answer to that question. So that was one of the questions. But um, I don't know where, we, where were we going with this. Well, I, I don't know either. But let me ask you one more question, and then we'll move on. We'll get out of the 60s. But this is a kind of here and then, or now and then question. So... You come to town, someone comes to town, they're a tourist, they check out Planet Marfa, uh, it's got the groovy shapes and colors, and I mean that literally if you come here, if you're, if you're not from where I am sitting right now, uh, I'm speaking literally, it has weird shapes, it's got, it's almost like a wonderland of a beer garden, and it's got weird colors. But anyway, let's say you see John Johnson behind the bar, and you, as we all do with everyone, with each other, you make up your own story about the guy. And you, you, the story would be, I would think, kind of like this hippie-ish guy traveling Hill and Dale and VW bus and ends up here. And my question to you is, do you ever think in the back of your mind, like, uh, you know, these guys don't know that I was a fighter pilot or, I, you know, uh, these people don't know half of the story. This is me relaxing. But for sure. five years, I was doing something that was uh, at the pinnacle of history and it was literally life and death. Well, I think the Navy was a important chapter in my life, but I really put more weight on what happened to me after I got out of the Navy. You know, uh, I met my wife in Norway. We married. We had a destination in mind. We were going to live in Costa Rica. We came to the States and promptly got in my van and headed south. And if it hadn't been for being robbed at the beach in Acapulco, we would have made it to Costa Rica during the dry season. But as it was, we were delayed by several months. We found a place to live in Tosco, Mexico, and we spent months there instead of leaving because we, we enjoyed the place. Um, but once we got back to the States, you see, we hit Costa Rica in the rainy season for a desert rat. I couldn't take it. What year was that? 70. 71. So, okay, before we go any further, uh, 
you get out of the Navy, you uh, get a ticket to Europe because you, you basically got bitten by the, the travel bug. Right. You go to Norway, um, you, you find a very beautiful and smart lady, and you decide this might work. When was the first time also that's your wife ever saw Texas? Well, when we when I brought her from directly from Norway, my parents had sold the farm by that point, so we were, or, or I, I know I guess they, well anyway they were living in El Paso, and um, so they met us at the airport, and um, you know we spent some time in Juarez, which was fun, I mean the, with my parents as well, and and. Uh, partied a little bit but then uh you know to see this part of texas it wasn't very long we drove into it and uh when we when we could see the purple mountains i said now look isn't that beautiful look at this part of texas you know this is where i grew up and she was saying where where are you looking because norway is dramatically mountainous and yeah an incredible topography so it's totally different Scene that was that was 1971, but we were headed to Costa Rica, so we really weren't thinking about settling here. Yeah, but I'm I'm just curious because I can't imagine any place is different. Well, maybe Costa Rica during the rainy season, but Norway to West Texas is uh, that 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 proves love. Let me just say, (laughs) (laughs) she comes out here and stays with you. Uh, Before I forget, and we'll get back to uh, catching up on your life story or anything. But before I forget, I want to know. What um, Marfa, Valentine, Alpine, Fort Davis were like in the 50s, in the early, or the 60s, or any time, frankly, before the 80s. So give me your take on that stuff. Well, um, you know, I grew up on a farm that was 18 miles out of Van Horn. We got our mail in Van Horn, so we, uh, we had friends everywhere around in the area but we didn't spend a lot of time in marfa to be honest with you or fort davis um you know that valley had its own society and there were people in van horn that van horn was booming it had another valley to the north of it called wild horse where the farms were all equally well developed it was a huge farming boom happening with irrigation in this part of texas growing at what that kind time. of stuff Growing mostly cotton because there was a subsidy on cotton, but we grew tomatoes and onions, and there was an onion packing shed at one time. But there were several cotton gins operating full-time through the picking season uh, in both of those valleys. I worked at one of the cotton gins, the one that was located in Lobo, uh, one summer. Spent a whole summer in harvesting seedlings, working at the cotton gin. But... You know, uh, Marfa, and uh, at that time, Van Horn had not been bypassed by the interstate. So all of the motels were thriving on Highway 80, which ran from Dallas to El Paso. And, of course, 90 came up from the south and connected with Highway 80. So uh, it was always an interesting place because there were there's just an amazing flow of people coming through the area en route to one place or another. And running out of gas or breaking down or whatever. But Marfa was was famous for its, uh, you know, Marfa became famous for its glider, uh, you know, competition, which happened here. And some of those gliders ended up landing in my pop's field, hmm. you know. Uh, and he didn't mind. He helped them get the glider disassembled and on the trailer and, and back to the back to Marfa. But there, there was not a whole, I had my first, Fender bender here in Marfa, but it, you know, I didn't have, I never had a girlfriend from Marfa, so. Yeah, you're missing out. But let me, let me save again, but I'm going to ask you the question and we'll catch up. But I, I, what I'm interested in, and this is kind of a purely, uh, what's like Smithsonian style question. Like, what were the streets like? What were the stores like? How, what were people like? You know, clearly it, it's not what it is now. Okay, we're back with John Johnson. John, so the, the, I, we, we were just talking a few minutes while we were saving, but what I want to do, and this is contrived, you know, a lot of, I, I say, like, I want to drink a beer and have a conversation, but what I want to do now is really paint a picture. So it's, let's say it's 1962, and you, gas is cheap, it's 20 cents a gallon or whatever. W- what is uh, Marfa like? How does it compare in size and intensity to Fort Davis or Alpine? Is it just... 
uh, another West Texas town, or is there any way to imagine that someday it might become arty and kind of cool? No, no way at all. Mm-mm. No, this is a ranching town, you know, mm-hmm. and the ranchers around here did they their shopping here. And as far as I can tell you, uh, there is nothing really that distinguishes it in my mind from any other small West Texas town. Uh, you know, we had every summer we would have a skating rink brought in under a tent, like a circus tent. They'd set up a good hardwood floor, and they'd crank up the music, and all the teenagers would hang out at the skating rink for as long as that lasted. And we had drive-in theaters that were changing the movies every two days, so we could see first-run movies, a new one on Sunday night, a new one on Tuesday night, another one on Thursday night, and a double feature on Saturday night. Two, two drive-ins in Marfa? I don't know about Marfa, but Van Horn had the Sage Theater. Uh-huh. That's where we all went. Any any good movie memories? What's any? Well, yeah, you know. Uh, what's, what was something stuck in your mind, movie wise? Well, you know when they were filming Giant out here. Uh, well, we let's, tell, to, let's tell everyone that. Okay, so uh, prior to Mr. Judd, uh, the most famous things that happened out here were John Johnson and the filming of Giant with Elizabeth Taylor and James Dean, and that was probably fifty-eight ish. Yeah, I think it was a little earlier, 57, but um, we would drive out. One of the couple of the teenagers at the high school had cars, Mm -hmm. so we would pile in a car and drive over to the movie set and watch them filming, which was over here near Valentine. Uh And uh, we couldn't get beyond the barricades that separated Mm -hmm. us from the major stars. So, But one day we did catch a glimpse of a cameraman and rock huts and tossing Elizabeth Taylor between them like that. She was small and light, and they were big, buffed-out guys, and they were tossing her, and she was laughing Mm -hmm. in the most natural way with that long black hair, shiny black hair just in the wind. And uh, But, you know, uh, there was a guy that used to sit on the old truck, uh, the, the old rusty truck that they had parked out in front of the set, and he didn't seem interested in headed to the trailer as quickly as some of the other actors. And we got to talk to him, and it turned out he was James Dean. We didn't know it, that he was anybody special because Rebel Without a Cause hadn't come to the Sage Drive-In yet. So <laughs> we got to talk with James Dean, but we didn't really know much about him, you know. Um, when, when we finally saw the movie then, we said, oh, my God, that's the guy that we were talking to. And, uh, and James Dean is is about your age, I'm guessing. I was, think he probably close. Yeah, uh, so maybe a little older. So when you saw him, it was like another guy, kind of. Well, uh, yeah, you know, he was a guy in his prime uh, that was in the movie business, so he was still, you know, a celebrity in our minds. Yeah. John, if you don't mind, I mean, we're, we're getting to sound like a history of John Johnson, but I'd love to just dance around a bunch of little questions I got. Is that cool? Sure. Okay. Because uh, I, as I told you, I tried to avoid journalism and history, but uh, in your case, uh, they sounded good. So this is the question. I go over in that back room, and the books you have would make you seem like a Ph.D. philosopher. Do you, in fact, have a degree like something like that? Yeah. Well, uh, you know, after I, I was working at a at White Rock Lake Park in Dallas in the landscape management side of that. Uh, It was a job, basically. I was paying my rent. I was living on Bonita Street with my lovely wife, Osa, who didn't speak much English. She was really not employable in Dallas, White Rock Lake Park. Mm -hmm. White Rock Lake is kind of an exclusive area. H.L. Hunt has his house on that lake, lakefront, and it's sailboats only in uh, But it's right in the heart of Dallas, so it was a 10-minute commute to get to my work. But I had an old motorcycle injury that acted up, and I had to go to the VA hospital and have it operated on. When I came out of the VA hospital, I had a cast up to my knee, Mm -hmm. and the park department said, well, we were wanting to move you toward management because you have a college degree and you were an officer in the Navy. College degree from where? The University of Texas at Austin. In what? Well, I had a history degree with a minor in Spanish. Okay. Wow, that, that's, that's very foretelling, because those are both things that you, on a daily basis, deal with. 
today. In a way. In yeah. a way, that's true, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, uh, I, I, I didn't know how I was going to pay my, my bills. Mm -hmm. And uh, I went to the... I, I said, okay, well, I've got GI Bill. So I went up to the college at North Texas State, and I said, what's the shortest-term program I can enroll for? And they said, what? You've got to have a goal. You've got to have a, something you're working towards to enroll. Mm -hmm. I said, well, what's the, you know, I've got a college BA degree. They said, well, you could enroll as a teacher for a teacher certificate. And even though at that point I had no respect really for teachers and had no intention of ever enter, entering the education field, I said, okay, sign me up because it's a six weeks program and I can get this cast on my, off my leg and get back to the job with the country boys I like down at the, at the lake. Um, well, I had a professor there when we started writing papers and he got to know me and reading my papers. He said, I think I understand where you're coming from in terms of teaching. He said, but I think there might be a place for you. Go visit this camp over near Tyler for kids off the street that are adjudicated delinquents and see what happens, see what you think of it. It's called the Salesmanship Club Camp of Dallas, and the Byron Nelson Golf Classic that happens every year in Dallas supports this camp for mm -hmm. adjudicated delinquents. It's for boys only, or at least it was at that time. So I went over and I spent a weekend at the camp, and I came back convinced that I'd found something that I could that I could do. It was in the outdoors. It was working with kids to try to help them understand some basic facts of life, which uh, had a good record of turning kids around from the streets of Dallas, going back and not not getting back into trouble. It had a good record of turning kids around. This time they would spend in the woods building their own shelters and digging their own latrine, cooking their own food and trying to get along with each other on a daily basis, right, in small groups living in the woods. I came back, and I, so, uh, you know, well, I actually, I talked to them at that, that weekend. I said, uh, you know, what would it take for a person to work here? And they said, well, you don't have any background working with children, and you don't have any education that prepares you to work with children. So our suggestion is you go get some experience or some more education. I said, okay, thank you very much. And I went back to school and told the professor what I'd learned. And he said, well, there's only one program in the state of Texas that works with emotionally disturbed kids, and that's in San Marcos. So I went down to San Marcos and interviewed with Dr. Zedler for this, to, to be admitted into this master's program in special education. And uh, the program had a lot of women enrolled, very few men. Uh, Emperor Zedler sat me down and she said, well, your grades in college were not all that outstanding, you know. I understand your motivation to enter this field so you can work with these kids, but uh, it's kind of questionable. And she said, I see on this uh, application that you speak Spanish. Is that correct? And I said, yes, ma'am. And she said, Olga, come in here a minute. So the secretary came in. She said, okay, have a conversation. I'll listen in. So she had me engage in a conversation with this young lady. Well, I had no problem, you know. Platiquemos como en, re en realidad como familia, ¿verdad? Mm -hmm. So uh, we did that. Habla español. And she wrote, she wrote down, check, you're accepted. Uh -huh. So I got into this program and ended up with a master's degree in special ed. Well, I went back to the, the Help a Boy Camp and Salesmanship Club in East Texas, and I said, I'm ready to go to work for you now. I have a master's degree, and my master's thesis focused on programs like yours versus residential treatment programs for kids that are in trouble. And, I've, you know, it documented the fact that for one-fifth of the cost, you guys can get the same level of, of uh, success with these children as these residential treatment centers that cost so much more. And uh, they said, that's great, and we appreciate your thesis, and we'll probably use it, but we've just passed a new policy that we don't accept married people anymore. We had a divorce in our family here, our family being the counselors that work with the children, and um, it was too, it was an unhappy event for us. We've decided we're not going to hire any new hires that are married. You're serious. Mm -hmm. I've been spending this year and a half to get ready to do this. So I went back to, uh, excuse me for a minute. I'll call you back, okay?
So uh, that was I went, about the shortest phone call I've ever seen. Good work. I went back to San Marcos, and uh, mm -hmm. then I went down to the Hope Center camp near Houston, the same type of operation, a wilderness treatment center. And I told them I'm ready to go to work for you guys. They said, well, that's great, but we've just adopted the same policy that the Salemship Club camp, we heard about the divorce, and we don't want to see that here. So, you know, these were Christian organizations, and they, they really were serious about it. So I went back to, to San Marcos, and I was sitting there with my wife on a Sunday, Sunday morning when these, they have these inane talk shows where they interview community leaders. You know, you never watch it. Mm -hmm. These city leaders that come forward, and they're interviewed on local television. But they had this fellow on named Damaso Hernandez, and he said, Camping is good medicine for the panza and for the coconut. Mm -hmm. And he was just going on like that. This guy was off the wall, and I said, i got to go meet this guy. He's working with troubled kids from the west side of San Antonio. Maybe I could work for him. So I went down to San Antonio on Monday, and I went to see him. And he said, well, Johnson, he talked to me, interviewed me, and he said, well, Johnson, you know, it's very nice that you want to work for us, but I've never hired a weto to work in our program. This is a West Side program. We work with the toughest kids, uh, blah, blah, blah. So I said, well, maybe I could work for you volunteer work and because uh, I was impressed with the man. And he said, sure, you can help us out on the weekends if you want to. Uh, can't pay you anything, volunteer work. So for the next three years, I did that. I worked for him volunteer work. And then... Uh, wow, until what year was that? Well, that was in, uh, that was in the 70s. Mm -hmm. Still, and um, then on in the fourth year, he hired me, hired me wow, to man. be his teacher in the classroom. This was a classroom. It's a of, long testing period, isn't it? I mean, he's this was a really distinguished gentleman who was sending his kids to prep schools in the east. They were coming back from Worcester, yeah, and then enrolling in Ivy League colleges and coming back to San Antonio as physicians and attorneys that, that, that strikes me though almost is like some type of uh japanese kind of uh sensei you know teacher like he's saying okay you come to me you volunteer for two or three four years you basically learn this stuff uh you don't know it until you teach yourself and then you, you've got it and you've got it good and now i'm hiring you yeah he became my mentor <laughs> and uh that's why i often tell people well, he's one of the reasons why I often tell people that, like Willie Nelson's song, All My Heroes Have Always Been Cowboys, I say, All My Heroes Have Always Been Mexicans. Mm -hmm. Because when I grew up on this farm down the road here, my pop put a hoe handle in my, handle, my hands and said, we'll see you at dinner mm. when the men come in. So I got to know these men who were basically poor, uneducated men coming to to. to the states to do manual labor in the cotton fields and I gained so much respect by working side by side with them for them you know I gained respect for them that when did you learn Spanish well they they taught me the basic kid. language and mm -hmm. of course they sang all day long in the fields they were like black workers in the south I yeah. guess on chain gangs they would sing while they were working and you know you pick up the melody of language by listening John, we got. Let's. Can we go 15 minutes, 10 minutes more, something like that? Well, uh, if you want to cover just the surface, <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy to revisit it. If if I had the technology, I'd have one of these things in my no, pocket. No, you know, all the time. like I say, I've been a privileged person. I'm a privilege because I have a background. I've been able to do so many different things with my life. I've really been privileged that way. So, uh, that's one way of looking at it. I look at it like this. You've been privileged to have a mind that filters in the good and powerful and the uh, lesson worthy out of your experiences. And who's to say that someone couldn't have gone through your entire life with a different attitude, a different set of filters, and taken out a lot that was not so uh, uplifting? But, you know, that, that's a conversation for a different time. But I, uh, when you say you're privileged, I, I think what's you're privileged to have a mind that is that functions the way it has and I, th I think that there are lots of upbringings you could have benefited from with that type of attitude uh i want you to describe quick quickly planet marfa and then tell me how this place popped up uh i, I after i got my doctorate i was hired by a, a psych hospital in san antonio to be a direct program director 
and my the, my program was called Adventure Therapy. Mm-hmm. I did that for six years. When the hospital closed, and after six years, as a result, by the way, of an investigation by 60 Minutes into their billing practices, and they weren't the only one. It shut down all of the PIA system of psychiatric hospitals nationwide. Mm-hmm. Anyway, uh, when that fell out from under us, I had a department of about six to eight people, and I told them I was going to go out in the community and try to build a challenge course to work with the corporate clients that we were meeting every day, the uh, young, the, the, the adolescent clients that already were using our challenge course, in other words, kids with uh, drug addiction or dr- substance abuse problems, as well as the general psych community. And wh- when is this? Well, that was after I got my doctorate. I got my doctorate in 86. In what? It was an interdisciplinary degree that I was able to design myself. The, mm-hmm. So it wasn't doesn't fall neatly into any category, but basically it was an education degree, PhD. Can you, can you give the name, because we skipped it, but uh, I think it deserves mentioning, the name of the guy you considered your mentor who helped you out, the Mexican guy? Yeah, Damaso Hernandez in Demaso San Antonio. Hernandez. Okay. He, he died in 1980. Okay. That's when I decided to go back to school and get a doctorate because I was frustrated that I couldn't keep the program that he started 35 years earlier. Wow. I couldn't keep it going. It was a very controversial program. It was called the Wolverines in the west side of San Antonio. You ask anybody in the west side of San Antonio, my generation, even younger, about the Wolverines, they can tell you. Man, what year did he start that? Back in the 40s. Holy. Yeah. Mold. He was a genuine article. This man was an artist and a master teacher mm-hmm. and uh, just a genius with people. So I consider him to be my mentor. But my department at the hospital, to get back to that, sure. was called Adventure Therapy. And our job was to take adult psych, adult substance abuse, adolescent psych, and adolescent substance abuse patients that were in acute care, which means five to six weeks of treatment, then they're back on their feet in the community. It's not a chronic situation where, you know, you're working with patients who are enrolled for a long time. Short-term patients on canoe trips, rock climbing, uh, orienteering, map and compass in the hill country of Texas. And we had a ropes course on site. Ropes course? Yeah, a challenge course where you team building course where mm-hmm. they would have to communicate with each other to solve problems, real problems that involve physical movement, mm-hmm. lifting things, uh, balancing things, all that type of thing. It's uh, If you're not familiar with it, it I could tell you spend 30 minutes on ropes courses. But anyway, uh, when the hospital closed, I started my own company, and for the next 15 years we ran, I operated a company called Team Leadership Resources, and that, that was dedicated to uh, developing team work processes and improving organizational uh, compatibility between work workplace um, cohorts to get the job done in the workplace, mm-hmm. to improve their processes so they could communicate better and work better together as team. And uh, when I left there in 2004... It was because a young lady with a master's degree named Tammy Citron had had come forward five years earlier and joined us as a facilitator, and it worked her way up to a train-the-trainer position where she was training people to do that work with me. And she could relate to anybody. This woman was gifted. She had the ability to relate to CEOs of Fortune 500 companies like Kerr McGee and, and uh, General Mills who were companies that we had contracts with. We had contract with Spurs. We had contracted with Randolph Air Force Base. Other organization, any organization that had leadership issues, we could contract with them for training program. This woman was so gifted that I said, I, I've just got to, there's no way to advance her other than to give her my job, <laughs> okay? Yeah. So that was my succession plan. I'll give Tammy my job and my salary, and Osa and I will get out of here. We'll leave and turned the company over to her, and I very much trusted her to do the, a great job with it. So um, we moved out here, and we, we had already had a six-acre plot that we used for camping up in the mountains here. And in that same year, my father passed away, and I, with a small inheritance that I got from him, we bought this property here that we turned into Planet Marfa. And our intention was just to create a space that we could lease out 
to somebody else to run, mm -hmm. right? So we had a friend of mine from San Antonio, Mark Davenport, who always wanted to have a barbecue restaurant. Well, he came out here and opened Adobe Moon here on site after we got most of what you see now. We had most of it built by 2006. And um, he, that, op, that barbecue restaurant went for a year and a half, and Mark had trouble, uh, troubles with it as a business, so basically ended up uh, as a failed business after a year and a half, and he moved back to San Antonio. Uh, we looked around for people that might be interested in taking it over. For three years, we spent this place sat idle. And uh, during that time, I had prostate cancer and had to have surgery and went through some rough times. But at the end of three years, my wife and I decided that we would just have to try to run this place ourselves. So in 2010, we uh, reopened as Planet Marfa. And we have uh, been here ever, ever since, you know, open on a limited basis. We're a seasonal business that closes in the winter. So, and we're only open three days a week. So it's uh, something that two retired people age 70 can operate. Well, that's interesting to, to hear you say that because it, in my view, uh, and I can't be far off, even though I have no proof of this, I would guess the last two months have been your busiest two months ever. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. So that, that's kind of ironic. You didn't want to start the place uh, with yourselves. You guys kind of thought, well, it's a limited basis and whatever, but it has become quite successful. It's been a go-to place here. Well, thank God for that. Yeah, we're happy about that. We're now able to employ. We're, we've got three employees now. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we're providing employment for people that are local that, that want jobs or need, need work. So we're happy about that. What's your guess on why it works? Uh... We've been told that if this place, the way it's designed and set up, if it was located in a large city, that we would have a, a backlog of reservations that would not allow people to just walk in off the street because it would be so popular. And, uh, you know, I can't really tell you that we understand why, except uh, we do have, um, we do try to, Keep in mind that every customer is a valued customer. Our mission statement says, number one is have fun, build relationships, okay, and create value. That's have fun, six words. Build relationships and create value. Create value. Good. So you know, I worked with companies for years on developing mission statements. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's, that's the most concise one that I've ever been able to develop or see myself mission statements need to be something you can rattle off and know by heart and commit to mm -hmm. and that's a mission statement i can commit to you know we said on the challenge course we used to say we're just holding this space here for you guys to take time out from the workplace and build relationships have fun and learn how to create value together mm -hmm. well this bar this this Beer Garden is a place where people come to have conversations, mm -hmm. and conversations is the number one most important organizational development tool. If they can have conversations here, we'll hold the space for them to build relationships and make plans that ultimately we hope will create value. It reminds me of, um, I heard the story, Muhammad Ali was speaking at Harvard once, and uh, the the kids all said this is in the early seventies when he was you know banned from boxing. The kids all said, "Give us a poem, give us a poem." Uh. And uh, he, they was asked to give a poem, and so he said, "Me, we," <laughs> two <laughs> words, you know. <laughs> but that's a great mission statement too, and it's not so far from yours, frankly. Uh, I'm I'm having trouble getting there myself, but mm -hmm. I'd like to hear you expound a little more on that. Well, me we that is it's it is a business. It's not a socialist project. Uh, the it's idea a for profit is, business. It's a right? for profit business, but the we part comes in um, as part of the business statement. If it's not we, if people come here and don't feel like they're part of the W E, the us, the we, mm -hmm. yeah. you won't make a dime. No, that's right. They have to mm -hmm. they have to feel like they're being well served in our place and we try to do a good job of that. And uh you know, I tr I'm real I'm kind of a picky employer, I think. I'm I'm a little bit anal, but I'm not retentive. <laughs> so uh you know, I'm ready to tell people, look, uh, this is not good enough, we've got to do better and uh if you look around this place We've been complimented repeatedly on how 
clean. Mm -hmm. We keep it, and uh, that takes a lot of work. So, you know, that's really where they say in some polls taken of Americans, they say there's two things Americans hate most, commuting and housework. I've got none of one. I've got a ton of the other one. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You have a lot of books on religion, Eastern religions. Mm -hmm. Um, all kinds, all kinds. It makes me wonder, you grew up in Texas. Did you grow up as, with uh, kind of a strong Christian uh, background that the rest of the country associates with Texas? No, I was a Presbyterian, if you consider my mother's church. Mm-hmm. My father, Jimmy, didn't go to church at all. But, um, you know, I migrated to the Methodist church because the volleyball team there had more girls on it. Mm-hmm. So, Sensible. Uh, I was not a serious church going Christian I'll have to call you back thanks I'll tell you what man let's let's wrap it up here John thank you very very thank much thank you uh, handshake enjoyed it's not, it it's not over till the handshake there it's you go it's a pleasure thank you